this is the 50th Memorial <coughs> Celebratory Life Magazine, Celebrating Life Magazine book about the Kennedy assassination that came out just a few months ago. I was there 50 years ago, 51 years ago, when it all happened. And the, uh, I wrote about it really only once in, 19, in 2002. I was writing a book for my daughter, my then six-year-old daughter. And I wrote the story down of my experience during the assassination and following it. And the first line was, we were very young. And I was thinking last night, it's the first line of anything I have to say about the Kennedy assassination is, we were very young. And we were also very hopeful. The uh, media world at that point was quite specific in that Life magazine was incredibly powerful, probably the most single most powerful media medium in the country at that point. There were strong weekly magazines. There were three television networks and one big radio network that accompanied them on the broadcast. There were a few national newspapers and there were two news services, AP and UPI. The, uh, this happened only 15 years, 1960 rather, Kennedy was elected 15 years after the end of World War II. And that's important to keep in mind in terms of who was running media in the 1960s. And these were guys, the middle management, upper management, most of these companies were people who had served in the Army or the Air Force or the Navy during World War II when they were young men, when they were in their 20s, early 20s, early 30s. Now they were in their 40s and 50s and they had been home for 15 years. The world had almost forgotten about World War II. And many of them had met each other during the war in the Office of War Information or in OSS. And there was one constant that ran through management was that these guys had known each other for a long time, no matter whether they were working at Look or at NBC or CBS or Life. Uh, they probably served together during the war. So they had that history with the government. Life itself, in 1963, was printing 7 million copies a week, had 32 million readers. That's one twenty, it's a fifth of the American population at that point. There were only 162, 63 million Americans, they're now 300 million. It's quite a different country. We had 35 news bureaus. Now I think they have, what's left of it has, at the time rather, has maybe eight or nine that are rather small. The company owned much of the news. Time Inc., Life Magazine, when I went to work there, owned the astronauts, owned the Mercury 7 astronauts, and they bought them. Every astronaut got $12,750 a year. They could not talk to anybody else. We, all, we had them first. We owned the families. We owned all the coverage of the <coughs> early NASA work. And it was just assumed that, that that made sense. It was logical. We had that kind of power. The masthead was loaded with very talented people and extremely effective people. Had the best photographers in the world, arguably. Some of the best writers. Uh, some great newsmen. And they moved week after week, day after day. In 1963, in the summer, we, life started developing a story on Bobby Baker, on the Johnson scandals. We we're not unique. Time Magazine was also doing it. Everybody, but the story was coming up because it was starting to break open. The data team, headed by Bill Lambert and Keith, Keith Wheeler, who were in charge of the story, we were getting tremendous amount of information from the Justice Department. Part of the premise of life at the time, life management, was that <laughs> Kennedy was going to get rid of Lyndon Johnson. He did not want him to be vice president any longer. He'd had terrible problems with him. They didn't like each other. And uh, it was going to be done. And one way they were going to ensure that they could do it was in the magazine. The Baker scandal, first big issue for life, broke on November 8th, 1963. Time had already done a couple of stories. We had done one other small story. And this first story is how Lyndon Johnson was treated. One of the headlines was the high, <coughs> high living Baker boy scandalizes the Capitol 
the dread cry of, cry of, cry of scandal burst like a bombshell across the Washington autumn. That burst like a bombshell is associated with <coughs> the name of Bobby Baker, associated him with an incredible mingling of high office, high influence, and high living. Baker has served long and urgent, diligently as secretary to the former Senate Majority Leader, Lyndon Johnson. Johnson fashioned him into his leg man, mouthpiece, and satrap of power. Johnson couldn't have picked a better man. This is the Vice President of the United States we're writing about. <coughs> they also had another piece under the leg man and leader. For Lyndon, he was a Senate Majority Leader who was when he was Senate Majority Leader, Bobby was an indispensable confidant, a messenger, a pleader of causes, a fundraiser, and a source of intelligence. And that was a the minor, I mean, the material that was in that piece was remarkable. And it was about, as Ed mentioned, the Carousel Motel was had opened, and that was part of the big story. On the, the issue dated November 22nd, which came out on, I guess, the 16th or the 17th, there was more, and another piece headed up by Lambert and Wheeler. They're, the edit unit at Life had something like 11 people connected to it, and they worked very much on their own. I would visit editorial business manager, and I had been told to set up a separate budget line for them, and so that I'd done that, and I was kind of following the story. The, um, this is what we said then. Nobody knows how much more is hidden under the murky surface or which visible bumps are connected to one another or to more others or to what degree. And then we said, Bobby Baker was Lyndon's bluntest instrument running the show the way he wanted, putting the arm on oil bin for money and handing it out where it would do the most good. These leaders <coughs> also have use of a large and tightly cohesive clique called the embellishment, establishment rather than embellishment, the, uh, that was controlled by Lyndon Johnson. This piece brought Johnson more into the focus of the story, and there was to be a third piece. And the third piece was the one that was going to nail him. That would be the end of it, at the end of this series. And that was roughly scheduled <coughs> to run on Jan December 6th or 13th. And of course, on the, it was spiked on the 22nd, the day that John Kennedy was shot. It was spiked within two hours of the death. Uh, my boss was executive editor. I was, <laughs> everybody was totally confused. It was kind of ordered chaos. And um, we're walking into his office and he said to, some, to one of his secretaries, I want all the numbered drafts here. We've got to call it, we have to get them here. We have to, just have to get rid of them. And they pulled in the finished drafts on the Johnson story, which has still been held in the small group. It still hadn't been distributed widely across the magazine. That project was over. Uh, I remember saying to him the next day, why, how can you do that? How can you kill that story when you know how bad Johnson is? And he said, well, you can't, we can't kill two presidents in, in two days. And John McCormick would have been president. The place would have, the chaos would have been massive. It would have been Kennedy and then Johnson falls immediately. So instead, the magazine basically started treating Johnson as a hero. I mean, we made him Daniel Boone within <laughs> 10 days. The, uh, because power goes to power, moves to power. And that's exactly what happened. The, um, the initial day, when everything was breaking loose, the, uh, at about 3.30 in the afternoon, I got a phone call from a woman named Yvonne Spiegelberg Luter, who worked for Stern Magazine, a German magazine out of Hamburg, uh, who was a friend. And she said, I was all excited. And she said, there's a guy, I found a guy in, the, <coughs> in Dallas who works for a guy who has taken the film. This film is a movie of this thing. And if life will come, let us have it in Germany, we'll put you in touch with the guy. And I gave her to Dick Pollard, who was the photography director, and that was it. Pollard then hooked up with Dallas, said, this is who's the person to follow. Dick Stolle came in during that afternoon. And I say that only because <coughs> it's not a profound piece, but Yvonne spiegelberg Luter was the first person that handed that story to Life magazine. It, wasn't, it didn't generate itself in Dallas, and 
Uh, nobody has ever bothered to write that down at life, but it is indeed a fact. The, uh, I had, everybody's grabbing telephones. I grabbed one phone, and the guy said, I'm a photographer in Dallas. I've got a picture. I just took a picture of a guy being arrested in the Dallas Tech, in the State Theater. And I said, for Christ's sake, don't you realize the president just got shot? And I hung up on him. And through some miracle, a piece of karma, like 20 minutes later, the phone, I pick up the phone again. The guy says, I think we got cut off. I have this picture. <laughs> and I said, put it in a packet and overnight it, which was the standard routine. Everybody would say to anybody who called, um, and we'll see what we can do. And he did, the, it came in. It was that great picture of the guy with the hat on wrestling with Oswald in the theater. The, uh, we ended up, we sold that all over the world. The, um, <clears throat> the most amazing thing, the time, the time that Inc. did, or that Life did, during the immediate aftermath, and showed how fast we could react, was Tommy Thompson. That's mentioned heavily in The Day County Died, the book. Um, he moved Marina Oswald and Marguerite into a motel immediately. They were <laughs> like the astronauts. For a couple of hours, we owned them. And um, word came back, they got them, and the... Uh, Feds finally figured that out, and by the evening they had come in to take him. <clears throat> We'd already done all the pictures, and, and uh, Stolly was there, and the photographers were there, and we had the story, the story went, and they were kind of handed back to the government. The film itself, as far as what happened with the film, is anything, I just talked to a guy literally 20 minutes ago, who I've been trying to get in touch with for weeks, who <coughs> followed me into that edit job. And he had, I remember, at one point he said to me he had tracked the, tra the line of the film, where it went. And so I was saying to him on the phone, and he said to him, I'm just a little late, I want to talk to you tonight, but do you remember this? And he said, yeah. I said, we, I went after it because people were upset, thinking a couple frames had been cut out, and we wanted to figure out where it could have gotten cut. And I think, John, maybe we will talk tonight at length. I want to hear more about this. The, uh, but we had the... <clears throat> Stolly bought the print rights for $87,500 plus 50% of the income was going to go back to Zapruder for the opener. And we discovered the next day, it was remembered that, oh my God, we don't have the, the uh, all media rights. And so <clears throat> we went back and bought them and p pushed the price up to around $150,000. It was simply an oversight. It wasn't that Zapruder it was first saying, his lawyer, agent was saying, we're going to sell you just the print. We forgot to point it out to him. And it's like the Texas State Theater photograph. We got those rights back, luckily. The, uh, and the film comes. It runs in the magazine. I sell <coughs> sets of four-inch frames, four-by-five frames, to, as shown here, Perry Matt, Stern, Epica, London Express, a major magazine in Sweden, one in Norway for $97,500, which in my mind is what we have paid for the film. So we've now covered it. And that's just kind of with the left hand. People are all over us saying we want the film, want the film. And I just said that's enough. It's like blood money. Um, and the beat goes on. The film itself was shown. I saw a print of it on Monday morning um, with six or seven other people. <coughs> Stalik says that one came back into New York on Sunday morning. And, uh, which is possible, and the, the C.D. Jackson and the power guys saw that all by themselves. The other thing that happened on that Sunday was, uh, we'll come to that in a moment. First, I want to talk about the other film. There's a second film, it's the Orville Nix film. <coughs> this is also a book by Gail Nix Jackson, who was a friend of mine. It is a fabulous book. Everybody in this room should buy it. That's my commercial moment. Um, and it talks about what happened to Orville's film, how the, <coughs> the, the original does not exist anymore as far as they're concerned. The, uh, they've never been able to return, retain it or get it back from the FBI. Uh, she tells the entire story of it. My end of the story was that I got a phone call from a friend at UPI saying that these guys have another film and they're coming in. And <coughs> I said, well, God, we want to talk to them by all means. 
So I set up a meeting with the general manager, Arthur Keeler, and our business manager for the corporation. And Orville Dix Sr. and Orville Dix Jr. walk in with their film. And this is taken from the other side. And Orville was running across the grass, <coughs> holding the camera to his side. And he didn't realize at the moment it was on. And it was on. And he caught quite a bit, not a lot of it. And it wasn't as close and tight as, as the Pruder film, but it was an interesting and important material. I had said, as a the punk kid, and to the big guys, you know, this is, we've got the most unique piece of historical film ever created in Zapruder, and so let's, pull, why wouldn't we buy this also? Put it in there. So Orville, senior and junior, come in. We set up a meeting in one of the power <coughs> dining rooms, and they show the film, and the general manager looks at Orville, who's this huge, raw bone man, and uh, very nervous, and says, leans back in his chair and says, for a nuisance value, we'll give you maybe $5,000. And I said to Gail when I took my her just a few months ago, I was watching this man, and I watched his fists tighten. And I was thinking, he's going to punch out the general manager of Life magazine. And I was kind of hoping he would. I thought he had every reason to do so. And, uh, and then he and his son turned and walked and left, went out. UPI ended up owning that film. And then Gail tells a story, which is really interesting, about what's happened since, trying to track it back. But it never got shown much. On that Sunday, <coughs> I came out of my boss's big office <laughs> in mid-morning, and there's, we're in the elevator bank right there. Elevator door opened, and the guy in a suit comes out, and he's got a little envelope. And he says, do you work for Life magazine? I said, yeah. And he said, here. And I said, what is this? And he said, this is for the magazine. And I said, well, don't you want, I mean, maybe it's, you want to see <coughs> Phil Wooten, my boss. And he, and he said, no. And I said, well, is there something to sign? And he said, no. And I said, who are you? And he pulled out an ID and flashed it. And said that he was with the FBI, say he. At which point he gets back in the elevator and leaves. And I'm holding this envelope. <clears throat> and in the envelope is an eight millimeter film on a blue sort of spool, which is Oswald on, in New Orleans handing out handbills for Castro. This is being distributed by the government Sunday morning. They're already moving it around, making the case, building the case stronger. <clears throat> Oswald is killed shortly after this. This is before he was even dead. The, um, in this picture, in the, in the current magazine, in the book here, it says, in the image from a news film, I mean, this is from a news film, but it was distributed by the government. And that, that picture is run all over the world. <clears throat> we were getting heat from the very beginning about the rifle pictures, and we've had the Oswald pictures. Within a few days, the uh, chant was going up outside that this was, had been fixed, that it couldn't had been put together as pastiche. And uh, Mark Lane was already making a lot of noise. I went to Ralph Graves, who was one of the assistant managing editors, and I said, Ralph, <coughs> this is, I, I grew up in Iowa in the Midwest, so I'm still pretty dumb. And uh, I said, Ralph, why can't we just take that picture over and show it to Lane? And quiet, shut him up. I mean, this, of course this isn't fixed. And he said, no, we don't want to touch that thing. It went away. I went down to the art, the art room, layout room, and got the layout piece that had been prepared for the magazine that they shot from. <clears throat> and the rifle sight had been retouched mightily. There was all this shading and ink and everything on it. And interestingly, in the, um, in the Warren Commission, there's a quote from Ed Thompson, who was, was a kind of editor emeritus at that point, who says, life is not in the business then or now of doctoring photography. I mean, we've been painting up photographs from the very beginning, I think from 1936. The, um, and that picture had been retouched. I don't know how much <coughs> change it made. I had the flat. In my office, um, I had a big carton. 
And I was putting Kennedy stuff in there. I was putting flyers, handbills, newspaper sheets. The, um, I stuck that picture in and figured that we were going to, I knew we were going to be selling things. We were going to start moving stuff, so it was, it was created a, a slight assemblage for it. <clears throat> and when I left the magazine, that was in the box that I took home. And I'll come back to that. The, uh, but the rifle did look, in this picture, it looked a lot different than the rifle that is being held up here in Dallas. The, um, the commission itself was really kind of the, the final word by, by Life magazine. Johnson, after the, we did that cover on December 13th and did pieces on Lady Bird and we did the boy at home and we ran around took pictures of the daughters and we did the entire, entire press job on him to a 25% or a quarter of the country week after week after week. And <clears throat> incredibly persuasive, as was everybody. And Johnson knew that Johnson was good. He did civil rights, for God's sakes. The issue in the, that became the memorial issue to Kennedy had a big piece in it by Teddy White about black majorities in the U.S. and how important it was that things finally happened. That also had been fed in from the government. It was being done in hand with them, getting ready for, to go after the Civil Rights Act, to create a Civil Rights Act. Johnson had nothing to do with any of that front end, none of the foreplay. The, um, and ended up getting tremendous credit for it. And has recently been given and honored for it in the last few months. I mean, big, big symposiums. <coughs> anyway, the Warren Commission finally comes out. And the, uh, we saw this morning this business of the New York, the New York Times had about the commission and the, the reporters and the great coverage they gave it. Well, life, we had Gerald Ford writing an essay for us, being credited as an essay. The, uh, the commission pieced together the evidence told by one of its members, the, an inside account. And <coughs> what, he, what they said, what life said, is this. The Warren Commission, this is, <coughs> again, the news coverage. Commission has established that there is not a scintilla of credible evidence to suggest a conspiracy to kill President Kennedy. The evidence is clear and overwhelming. Lee Harvey Oswald did it. Um, <coughs> Ford, in his piece, does one section where he says, Our most important, the most important witness to appear was a neat Bible-reading steam fitter from Dallas. His name was H.L. Brennan, and he had seen Lee Harvey Oswald thrust a rifle from a six-floor window of the Texas Book Depository and shoot the President of the United States. <coughs> Even at the time, when I was really early in my career, I remember reading this coverage and thinking, if I were the editor, what would I have done to this? And there's no way Gerald Ford even saw these words until the last day. He didn't write this thing. And, um, I, most of it would have been, I would have even insisted that they rewrite it. It was just almost too close to being yellow journalism. He says <coughs> in the Brennan thing, after the second bulletin was issued, Officer J.D. Tippett stopped Oswald on the street, and Oswald shot him dead. <coughs> and then it says Brennan's descriptions differed in details, um, although he picked him out later in the lineup. It's a whole other question. And then it says, <clears throat> this set off first of countless rumors that two men were involved. Thus, both were a, here and abroad began a cascade of innuendo, supposition, imagination, twisted fact, faulty analysis, and downright fantasy that surrounded the tragic death of John Fitzgerald Kennedy. The, uh, and this is how Ford deals with the players, under heading an unusual cast of characters. There was the mother, Miss Marguerite Oswald, a singularly angry woman whose strange attitudes and actions provided an appropriate background for the strange son she had shaped. Her irrational allegations gave set, set one of the most persistent and dangerous and completely untrue rumors that Lee Harvey Oswald was or had been an agent of the U.S. government. 
And it says, there was also Oswald's handsome Russian wife, who as time went on and conflicts began to develop in her testimony, emerged as a complex and even mysterious person. And then they say, <laughs> the congressman says, there was Robert Oswald, the brother, a solid and hardworking man whom Lee seemed somehow to have loved and yet held in sharp contempt for just these traits. And then they say, he says, there was Jack Ruby, a sad and strange little man in the Dallas County Jail who would kill the only man who could have said in certainty just what happened. And then, then we, thus we came gradually and finally to the end of our assignment. We spent nearly two months writing our massive report on which all of us with our different backgrounds are agreed. And we heard a lot about that this morning. The report is the truth as we see it and as best we know it, and on this we rest. Now, I got, a couple of weeks later, my, we had, on the strength of the <coughs> moving the Kennedy assassination film around, we set up a syndication operation, which they gave to me to run. Uh, which was really inventing a press service of using timing material to start moving it to other publications. The, uh, the fact that I had, as a result, I was a strange nexus within the company and that I had an editorial function <coughs> and I also had access to the money, to checks. I could get checks written. I get a call from the general manager, Keeler, saying, come on up. I walk into his office and he says, this is Gerald Ford's assistant. And I shake hands and he says, I want you to go get a check for four Congressman Ford for $5,000. It's a lot of money in 1963. And um, I said, okay. And I went down and it came back an hour later. The Ford guy is sitting out in the waiting room then. We walk back in, I hand him the check. Keeler nods, I leave. I said, we have now paid off the Congressman. The, uh, this became a thing that happened in a lot of different areas from that moment on, which you can get to later. The, um, this again is back into the piece. But at the end, <coughs> again, we had turned Lyndon Baines Johnson into an outdoorsman country hero, and Lee Harvey Oswald is a heartless, strange, weird killer. Um, and that was the right of check for Congressman Ford. There was some fallout a little bit later. I mean, everything starts to move. Everybody gets back into the world, and the Beatles come to America, and, <clears throat> you know, and things are moving or kicking out. The, uh, in 1967, I had just left the magazine. When I left, I moved out. I had, I had my carton. I did four or five cartons in my office, moved them all home and really didn't pay much attention to what was in them. <coughs> and um, was reading the New York Times one morning and it said that this book, that Time Inc. has gone after a publisher over a book that was about to print saying they had, <coughs> had, they had copyright infringement in terms of the Zapruder film. And I called my friend at UPI and said, do you know anything about this? And he said, yeah, this guy named Tink Thompson has got this book. And he'd done work at life. And I said, well, call him. And if you want to set up a meeting, I will tell him where the copyright got broken. They have no case at all. It's, a, it's been destroyed. <clears throat> so we did. And we met in Costello's bar on 3rd Avenue about 11 o'clock at night. And uh, he walked in. And I told him the story. The New York Times ran it on their cover on the third anniversary issue of the assassination of the Times Magazine. And they, they ran all the still frames. Like they ran, we had 31 in the magazine initially. They ran something like 28 on their cover. And I had gone at the time, my part of my job also was to protect the copyright. So I ran into the lawyer's office and said, what do we do about this? And he said, <coughs> nothing. So New York Times are friends of ours. Our chairman was married to one of the daughters of the corporation. The, um, not worth bothering with, so I didn't. But that effectively broke the copyright. If you don't pursue every single one, that's why Disney goes after little tiny ice cream stores, uh, you lose it. So that's what I tell Thompson. He said, 
at that time, he said, can I use your name? And I said, well, I prefer you don't. I've got a book. I'm working, dealing on a book with Time Life Books right now, a big book with a guy named Tommy Ungerer, who was a children's illustrator. And we're right at the tail end of signing the contract. So I said, if you can keep it quiet, it'd be great. But if you have to, go ahead. I get a call the next afternoon and from the <laughs> secretary to the editorial director of the Time Life book saying, you'd like to meet with you at 3 o'clock. I think it's, this is great. Now we're, gonna, we're through with the contract. So I walk in. They had this big presentation book that had all the art in it. And he picked it up and he threw it, literally physically threw it at me. From his sitting position, he hoisted this thing up. And I grabbed it, art spilling out all over the place. And he said, Jack Dowd called me, who was the lawyer, one of the lawyers, and said, we're not working with you anymore. Um, and that was it. They had, Bernard Geis had said, in opening his conversation, he had named me and said that the copyright was broken, they had no case. And they didn't, the books were shipped like the next day. The, um, at the time, I wrote a note down that said, the only time in my life I think I've ever burned a bridge while walking over it. And <laughs> I was out of that building with my loose art and my board and that was it. And I didn't get any work out of them for like five more years uh, until everybody had kind of turned over and I finally did some more stuff with them. In 1975, <clears throat> was when Geraldo did his show and showed his bad print of the film of all the production. And a friend of mine worked with him before, a man named John Parsons, who was news director at Channel 5 in New York. And <clears throat> I'd been talking to Parsons before the show, and I said to him on the phone, oh, by the way, I have a copy of that film. I have a print of the Zapruder film, which I'd never mentioned, never said anything to anybody. And uh, he said, oh, my God. And we talked back and forth, and I gave him some people that they might want to add into the show. And that was it. I was in North Carolina when the show played and <laughs> came back up two days later. I had a loft on East 93rd Street, a fifth floor walk up, tenement loft. In the, uh, the box, the carton, was in the top back of a large linen closet behind a bunch of linen. And I walked into the apartment and knew something was wrong, but I couldn't figure out what it was. I had standard New York City triple locks on the door. <clears throat> and was, I figured nobody could ever enter this place, but walk in and then it, I, went and I opened that closet and looked up and that box was gone. It was the only thing missing from the house. And uh, they got the film back and they got the <coughs> retouched board and they got all the, I had pockets, all the Alec Heidel ID things that had been printed in the Life Photo Lab. The, um, it all went, everything went. Five minutes, and so that was the end, the box is missing. That was the end of the big fallout. Um, the story itself went on, the, now the magazine now has come to where the public is now in a way, in terms of the book and the magazine is gone. <clears throat> and that the book keeps saying throughout, maybe there was a plot, maybe there were two people. And like little lines and like 10 point, 10 agate, 10 point type. Um, <clears throat> but that's the extent of it. But basically, it's reconfirming what we, as a magazine, did was right. It was great. We were powerful. We were wonderful. We were entertaining. Here's a book to entertain you. And that's what they printed. What really happened <clears throat> all over the place, like people like Gail Nix Jackson and me, there have to be hundreds of us who had little tiny edges of this story. We we're kind of happy to be happened to be standing someplace that something really happened, we saw it happen, or we had <coughs> single roles and moving it along. Um, and that people are still out there, and the guy I talked to this afternoon, that life is still out there and has information to add. And so I'm pleased that it's not over yet, and it's still continuing. If there are any quick questions, I will do them. Just uh, two quickies. Uh, first. Was the Zapruder film you saw Monday morning, was it in color or black and white? And the second part of the question is, do you recall it being the same as the film we know today? It was in color. And I honestly don't know the answer to that question. I, I have this dim memory 
of watching it open with cars coming around the corner. But I could not swear to it would make sense. Coming around the corner? Yeah. Oh, that's huge. First frames. James, one more. Yeah. Two, two, a couple more. Right. Yeah, way back here. Did you see the Gale Nix film ever? When it was up front? Yes, I did. Do you remember what you saw in it? Yeah, it shows a blurred version of the of the grassy knoll. Um, shows the car <coughs> after the fact, and then it swings up and catches the knoll. The question is, is there somebody else up there? And they've done prints on that. Sorry? Did you see the car stop? No. Not this. This is a 23-second total film. Not enough. Yes. She got just got a phone call, straight flat out phone call from one of her stringers in Dallas, who called her right away. He was in the courthouse, courtroom, or courthouse, and that's the same serendipity. I mean, you get a story, you move it. She did it. Did a great job. Did you charge them, by the way? Or? Sorry. Did you charge Stern, or did you let them have that? Did we? I'm sorry. Wasn't the deal that if you gave it to them, she would give you the name of the computer contact? Wasn't that the original? Yes, idea? which she did. And then Pollard sent it down to Patsy Swank, who then told Stotley when he arrived in town that we had the thing. And in the, <laughs> the book now, they say a reporter, realizing Patsy Swank worked for life, gave her the tip. Well, no, it didn't work quite like that. It was a fun, people were looter, did it? So. I think I'm the next guy. You are? The next question, if you okay. will. Uh, first of all, um, I'm proud to say that I recruited Mr. Wagenvoort to come here. He's an American patriot and a hero. And <laughs> let me just add one last little finisher on it. Uh, the reason why we hooked up is because we're bookends. Um, one of the key people who had the dirt on all of these people, Murkison, Conley, Johnson, Hoover, was the manager of the Del Charo Hotel out in California. If you see the guilty men, it makes references to it. And this man, Alan Whitworth, was a whistleblower. And he was, the, he was the guy who had the dirt on these guys. And his people wanted him to talk. And of course, he was greedy. He wanted money, uh, but he met with them. And all the people that uh, I knew Alan Whitworth for about six years, from age 77 to 83, and all the people that he was telling me about meant nothing to me, but he worked with them all. He knew them all. And um, it stopped on 11 22 63, so to speak, but some of them kept working secretly on trying to do it. And once the powers that be found out about it, it was stopped. And the thing yeah. he didn't know, in other words, I can back up his story. Okay, with Alan Whitworth. But this was something he didn't know, because he said he never knew why it just stopped after it stopped. It was still kind of sneakily going along. And Drew Pearson, one of the major journalists at the time, told Whitworth the following. Pearson said that when J. Edgar Hoover and Linda Johnson had discovered the scope and intent of the expose to be published by Life and Bobby Kennedy's assistance with Life, J. Edgar Hoover called a secret meeting that was attended by Robert F. Kennedy, U.S. Attorney General, Lyndon B. Johnson, President, and Henry Luce, Publisher of Life Magazine. At this meeting, J. Edgar Hoover made it perfectly clear, not Nixon perfectly clear, but J. Edgar Hoover perfectly clear, that if Life went ahead with this expose, there would not, there would only, there would not only be no John F. Kennedy Camelot myth, but what he had documented over the years about the Kennedys, including Judith Campbell, Hanky Panky, would hit the front pages of the nation's press. Whitwell wrote, Bobby Kennedy backed down and Henry Lewis suppressed the most important explosive expose of all time. Now he and I do not know if this is true, but when I told him about it, he said, well that would make sense. Yeah, it does. And, if, and, and then the thing, the speculation came out that maybe when Bobby decided to run for president, he was threatening Lyndon with, now the thing that got suppressed back then, we're going to put it out now and then Lyndon backs out. And of course, if there's any truth to that, that might be why Bobby Kennedy is dead. Anyway, great man. Thank you. That's right.
writing teams that worked on the Baker LBJ special were really the best people that worked for the magazine. It was kept as a single unit. I, I ran a budget for the whole group. When the project ended, the story itself that was scheduled to come in on January 6th or January 13th was spiked. But the material was still there. The reporters who had worked on it still had what they'd done. A group was put back together after Johnson is in office in like December, early, early January, <clears throat> to look again at the assassination and get all the detail that one could possibly get out of it. And that's when Josiah Thompson came on board as a consultant. Um, Dr. Weck, Sir Weck actually worked in the same project a little bit. He saw this when he saw the Zapruder film. The uh, team was killed about three months later. And in the meantime, they'd done a lot of interviews. That's when they really, Ed Tetro talked about the uh, work on the West Coast with the, the uh, hotel out there. And <clears throat> Lambert, who had run the project, when this project is over again, so once again, there are more files put together. The Justice Department people from, with Bobby, who had sent the material up here, they still had the material. They had a, certainly copies of the original pieces, the drafts that were destroyed in New York. The uh, team itself stopped. An example of how much they had already started was that Bill Lambert, who had gotten the Pulitzer Prize some years earlier as a newspaper reporter for, for exposing Dave Beck, who was a Teamster official in Seattle. A, a, uh, it was a huge story in the late 50s continued with the material. And two years later, he went after Abe Fortas and exposed Abe Fortas, and his work was responsible for getting Abe Fortas knocked off the Supreme Court, Johnson's appointee to the Supreme Court. It really came right out of the body of this material, and it was still there. But the thing that was interesting to me was that these guys stayed with it. They also kept it within themselves, because what they were, their commitment was to Life magazine, not to anybody else. Um, and Lambert's work was spectacular, beautifully done. The Zapruder film, I talked yesterday about how much money we paid Zapruder. There was one moment towards the end I don't think I mentioned, which was that when, like three days in, Zapruder, I was in Dick Pollard, photography director's office, and he, gets, he picks up a telephone, and I hear him saying, you know, for God's sakes, relax, why don't you just give some money to tip his widow? and tell him that that's how much you got from us. And he'd gotten a phone call from Zapruder saying, this is blood money, I feel terrible, what's going on? And <clears throat> Pollard said, no, give him what represented at that point 25% of the first money that we had given him. Again, Zapruder had 50% of all the income also. The, um, and he did. And so there was an announcement in Dallas of a Tippett Foundation that had been put together with $22,000, which was the sum total of all of the money that Zapruder got for the film. And he was, felt good about it. He was no longer looked at as being recovering blood money. In the Warren Commission testimony, when they asked him how much money he made from the film, he said $22,000. Um, which was an interesting thing about that one to me was that everybody in the business knew that that was not true. The, um, nobody ever challenged it, just let it go. And then some years later, what, four years later, life timing for one dollar gave the film back to him. He'd already made several hundred thousand dollars out of the film. And then we as taxpayers got to buy it back for 16 million dollars uh, for the U.S. Archive. And no one has ever been able to explain intelligently how and why that was priced to that point or how and why that happened. And now people had criticized Time Inc. and Life in particular for sitting on the film, not letting people really see it. Now you can't see it. Unless you go through the sixth floor museum and you work yourself down and you get approvals that take months and months and months even to talk about it, even to look at it, not use, let alone run it and print it. The, um, and that was the end of the <laughs> time ink involvement with the Zapruder film. Another repeating footnote is that buy this Orville Nix book <laughs> from Judith. 
<coughs> from Gail Nix Jackson. It is a great book. I keep saying that. The, with the Oswald, with the Bobby Baker story, rather, <coughs> the pieces that were run were remarkable. You can get them on your computers. All you have to do is hit Google Books, go life.com, and then <coughs> work through it. There are a lot of listings there that are people trying to sell you magazines. You don't have to pay attention to those. Find the actual Google Books Life entry, hit it, and they will, you can get any Life magazine ever printed and read it. You go into the screen and say <coughs> preview, and you can get the entire piece. <coughs> These pieces, November 8th and November 22nd, are spectacular reading. They will stun you when you read them. And, uh, they're very complex. What I talked about yesterday was just the dust on top of them. I mean, there's so much that went on in these pieces. So I suggest you go after them. The, uh, then take a look at December 13th, the Lyndon Johnson and his American hero issue, and you will see where the turn came. And we're, again, big media power follows power. And so Lyndon Johnson became the president of the country and of Time Inc. and of all media at that point. Uh, those are my three footnotes. My wife knows that every time I, we leave the house, if we get past the second corner without going back to pick up something that I left there, we've had a victory. So the fact that I'm back up here is, I didn't drive that well yesterday, but hopefully it's done.